Well, hello, my name is Sarah Veach, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Sarah Keller, who's giving her Living Histories talk today. Thank you for the kind introduction, Sarah. Okay, hmm. there we go. When I was a kid, my family moved around the US a lot, and my parents gave me an appreciation for good tools because we renovated the houses we were living in. Building that equity gave my parents the financial stability to send me to college out of state. And last week, there was a story collider featuring Andre Isaacs and Joey Jefferson. Their paths are really different from mine, but I, we do have some shared feelings. Andre talked about education as being a ticket out, and Joey talked about not belonging. I definitely wanted out of where I was. I, I didn't belong. So I went on a quest to find where I did belong, but I'm getting slightly ahead of myself. So backing up, in college, I became a physics major, both because my lab classes were like playing with toys and because I had a vague notion that I could support myself if I did something sciencey. In my sophomore year, I was excited to be chosen on a team of students going to Fermilab. My very first paid science job was cleaning bird shit off of the calorimeter that's in the picture. After painting the calorimeter, I spent the rest of the summer soldering four micron wires four millimeters apart on a drift chamber. It was mind numbing. It was also really lonely. I somehow wasn't allowed to live with my peers because I was the only woman on the student team. So particle physics wasn't as much fun as I had imagined it would be. And neither was astrophysics. My professor kept hitting on me and I did not want to enter a field in which I'd ever have to interact with him again. For one year, I studied in Britain, where I again loved my lab classes, but I was really put off by overhearing a professor talk about what a shame it was that there were so many women in this year's physics class. So no one experience like this was devastating on its own, but in their sum, they rattled me, even though I was so privileged in other ways. I cannot imagine how tough it was for the generation before me to succeed in science. And I cannot imagine how tough it still is for people who endure additional forms of prejudice. So back in the US as a senior in college, I helped organize the very first Take Back the Night March at my university. Then I met with university administrators to implement ways to make our campus safer. And seeing that change was really satisfying even though it was way too slow. I was still a physics major on paper, but my real major was college radio. At the time, I felt like all the things I was pouring my time into, documenting the station's broader impacts on the community, um, helping to file federal reports, public speaking, were orthogonal to any future career, but looking back, they were pretty great job training. Now, around this time, I figured out that you get paid to do a PhD in physics, and this blew my mind. Now I tell this to students in every class I teach. At the time, I had no idea how to turn a physics degree into a job and going to grad school seemed like an honorable way to avoid having to admit that I felt really lost. So I was shocked when I was admitted into some strong graduate programs, including at Princeton. And this acceptance was the start of a case of imposter syndrome that I've not really shaken to this day. The feeling of being an imposter was really only heightened when a dude in my class felt the need to tell me that the only reason that so many women were admitted to our class was because of our gender. So my imposter syndrome said that, well, he was probably right about me, but I knew he was wrong about the other women in the program. Deborah kushner feigenson had just won the Apgar Award. Vicki Caspi would go on to win the Shaw Prize in astronomy. So if any of you out there, Vasanthi mentioned it also, struggle with some of these same issues, some things that I found helpful are Delia Sines' research on the effects of tokenism, or a recent thread story by Dr. Kimberly Manning about how the feeling that you have to represent your demographic can be a, a weighty burden. Then when I failed the first year graduate exam, I might have felt like I was the only student who deserved to fail, but at least when I did, I was not representing all women in physics because the other women in my class were brilliant. Of all the students in the class, the whole class, one third of us failed. We banded together, we taught each other the material and we passed the exams. 
at the end of my second year, Saul Gruner, a biophysics professor, was just being polite and asked me what my plans were for the future. And I, I surprised him and myself by saying, I thought I'd join your group. <laughs> he said something like, maybe you should come talk to me about that. I made an appointment. Uh, he showed me every piece of equipment in the lab, like this X-ray beam line. And then he asked why I wanted to join the group. Um, and I got brave and I told the truth. I said, I, did, I didn't know anything about biology, but whenever I walked by his lab, the people in his group looked like they truly enjoyed each other and loved science. And I love science. And Saul looked thoughtful and said, that's how he got into biophysics too. He made it clear that we'd have a trial period and I had a lot of catching up to do. <clears throat> but now that I was in a group of people I really clicked with, the work was a joy. We made an early discovery that the activity of a particular ion channel is related to the spontaneous curvature of the lipids that surround it, and I was off and running. So toward the middle of grad school, oh, let me go back here. Toward the middle of grad school, a bunch of us women in the department met with a chair. We wanted some basic changes in the department, like removing pornography of naked women from the machine shop. And we also wanted to know why there were no tenure track women on the faculty. The chair told us that hiring a woman would be very difficult because she would have to be unassailable so that no one could say that she had been hired just because she was a woman. Well, I interpreted that to mean that she had to be better than nearly all the men on the faculty at Princeton. And that's when I stopped thinking I could ever become a professor. Now, the chair did say that some of the women in the program were strong contenders, and he was right. My housemate, Suzanne Staggs, later joined the faculty and was recently elected to the uh, National Academy of Sciences. So even though I felt that as a career as a professor was out of the question for me, I love universities. And I thought that an interesting career could be running an instrumentation facility. At the time, few groups were doing cryo-electron microscopy on membranes, and one of them was Joe Zasadzinski, who was at UC Santa Barbara. So I asked around, I heard that he was a good mentor, I wrote a proposal about the experiments I wanted to do, and I landed a UC Presidential Postdoctoral Fellowship in Jones Lab. Okay, now this is where the love line intersects with the career line. Shortly defending my PhD at Princeton, two really important things happened that affected the trajectory of my career. First, I did not marry the wrong person, and that was a close call. <laughs> Soon after, I fell in love with a boy in the lab next door, and he and I spent the next 10 years following career paths that finally landed us in the same place. A couple of years into my postdoc, my love wanted to go to a conference in San Jose. My office mate, Kai Lee, had worked with Hardin McConnell at Stanford, and because San Jose is near Stanford, I decided I would meet this Hardin person. By the end of our conversation, Hardin had offered me a second postdoctoral position, which I had accepted on the spot. And then I landed an NIH fellowship to do that research. In Hardin's lab, I was researching liquid-liquid phase transitions and lipid monolayers, thinking about stripe phases and critical phenomena. And I was also generating most of my own research ideas and directions. And the idea crept back into my head about maybe becoming a professor. I loved working with Hardin and the group, and I wasn't desperate to go. So that year, I decided to apply only to universities in cities where I was sure that my partner would be happy. So I applied to three universities, but I submitted eight applications in every possible field. And that's how I became a chemistry professor at the University of Washington with no change in my research focus. Now, my luck did not stop there. My first graduate student, first graduate student to join my group was the brilliant and driven Sarah Veach. We happened to be doing the right research at the right time. We were trying to find large scale liquid liquid phase separation in model lipid bilayers when the first paper showing how this behavior could be achieved was published in 2001. And we were hot on their heels with our papers in 2002 and 2003, measuring transition temperatures and tie lines. And on that 2003 paper has been cited over a thousand times now. Sarah convinced her fantastic friend, Ben Stottrup to join the group. Now, I might've initially taught Sarah and Ben about phase behavior and lipid membranes, but they got me tenure. 
and taught me how to how to run a group. They and many other students mentored up, and I'm so grateful to them. Now, nationally, several other women in membrane biophysics were hired at the same time. One year at a biophysical society meeting, I walked in, I ran into Erin Sheets, and I said, where are the rest of the membrane chicks? And Erin said, the what? And promptly printed all of us t-shirts. We didn't have an old boys network, so we became our own network. We shared stories about which colleagues you could trust and which ones you should not share your preliminary results with. We also noticed that some really outstanding senior women in our field had not won major awards at the Biophysical Society. So we ganged up on them and we encouraged them to apply. And almost to a person, these amazing scientists said, what, me, are you sure? Did some of them feel like imposters too? So as our groups grew, so did our network. And now we are senior women in our field and we badger each other to apply for awards. So a few years, years ago, I was badgering Kaili to apply for fellow of the Biophysical Society. And she said no, but to make me apply, she said that if I applied, she would apply the year after. I said, fine, I'll apply, but I won't get it. But I'll make you apply because you deserve it. Uh, and then I got the award. And so did she, of course. <laughs> So co-mentorship through this group is one of the highlights of my year. Um, since then, I've been lucky to work with so many talented trainees who are also really wonderful people. If I had more time to talk with you today, I'd tell you about each one of them and their discoveries, but maybe at a future talk. So that's it. Thank you for listening. Wow, Sarah, thank you for your inspiring talk. Um, there are a couple questions, maybe I'll, uh, here's one. So you you fought so many biases throughout your career. Um, what is your, what drives you most to continue advocating for people in your incredibly supportive way? Uh, them, I mean, there's, so, uh, I, uh, you meet these fantastic scientists and and it's it's those students and those mentees that uh that give me the energy to do that i mean there, there's there's a lot of uh things said about how uh this, this is a broad stereotype that that stereotypically women will fight for others in a way that they will not fight for themselves and so it's become the the, the things that i do which can often help me as well. I'm motivated to do that for others. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, uh, for your inspiring talk. <laughs>